Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for having me and a chance to discuss something. If you know me, you know this is one of my favorite topics, which is effective leadership and how to become a more effective uh, leader. So uh, I appreciate it. So let's, let's start with a question. Um, and I'm not going to be looking at chat, just so you know. Uh, but, but imagine this, you know, who said this? If your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, and become more, you're a leader. Well, would you believe that was early 19th century American president, and then he became a congressman, John Quincy Adams. So through our history, we have explored this notion of what does it take to be an effective leader? What does it take to have followers? Even, even before there was a Pulitzer Prize winning rap musical about one of our American leaders, you know, we've been contemplating this for millennia. So uh, we're, we're in the same boat, so to speak. And you know, leadership is not necessarily about leading a huge team. It's also about leading a medium-sized team and or a small team and or a team of two, or depending where you are on an org chart, leading through your influence. We all have the ability to lead. And so we all have the ability to lead more effectively. But I'm kind of preaching to the choir because uh, you're all here. So thank you for that. Uh, just for those of you who tweet during these things, if that's your inclination, I'm at Ken's Views at capital K-E-N-S, capital V-I-E-W-S. So let's dig right in if our slides go forward. Okay, so two thoughts before we really dig in. When, you create, when one creates a program like this, one doesn't know the experience, the skills, the expertise, how much leadership development you've done or professional development you've done or for how long you've been leading. So we try to create and offer content that will bring value to everyone. As a result, at some point, you may hear something you've heard before. You've heard a million times before. That's, you know, common sense. And it's going to be very tempting when that happens to sort of lean out and tune out, and maybe check your email. But I'm going to ask you that when that happens, really lean in and be brutally honest with yourself and say that thing that Ken just mentioned, that is something he says we should do. And I know it. I've known it for years. Dig in, be brutally honest and say, but do I really do that leadership tenet? or activity? Do I, do I do it effectively? Am I always doing it sort of on the excellence scale? And am I consistent with it? And do I do it, you know, in this five-star way consistently with everyone I lead, including those who maybe I don't like as well as others that I lead? I mean, once you're leading, if you lead a team of more than two, <laughs> there's always the possibility that you have a greater relationship or simpatico or just feel more of a connection with one of the people that you lead more than the others. But I think there is an obligation as leaders to lead them all as effectively as we can. So if that happens, please lead in. Next, you know, your ROI for the time you're spending today is really not about anything I teach you or the training or the wisdom. I really believe your return on investment are the actions you'll take as a result of our hour today. It is all about action. So I want to strongly encourage everyone on this call, you know, have a piece of paper. And if you hear something that makes you think, I want to take some action on that, please write it down. Please bullet it. Doesn't have to be paragraphs, can be a phrase or a sentence or a reminder of what you're gonna take action on. And I hope that at the end of the session, you'll have a lengthy, robust list of actions you wanna take. Because by writing it down, you have increased exponentially the chance that you'll actually take the action. So I hope you'll do that. Why is leadership so critical always and especially now? Well. Let me share something from John C. Maxwell. He's a respected, iconic leadership expert. 
And I think you all know if you've studied anything about leadership, you've got to create a vision, a vision for your agency, for your department, your group, or your organization. You've got to share that vision and then your followers, and I tend to think of them not just as staff members or team members, but as your followers, you know, are they in the proverbial rowboat rowing in the same direction toward that vision? And do they understand their role in achieving the vision and the benefits? So vision is very important to leadership. And John Maxwell says people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. Another way to put that is if you want them to buy into the vision, they've got to buy into you and your leadership. Now, there are many different definitions of leadership, but, but here's mine. You know, if you use your energy leadership, leadership energy, if you use your leadership energy, if you use your leadership, if you use your influence to create the outcomes that are best for that organization and your followers and its stakeholders, and maybe your peers, and maybe your boss, if you have one, if you're driving towards that, you are a leader. So everyone has the potential to lead and lead more effectively. Again, their team members, their peers, their boss themselves more effectively, regardless of location or team size or type of organization. So because your leadership energy goes out and affects all these others, the question isn't, am I a leader? You are a leader. The question is, how well am I leading? Much more important question to answer. So these are the eight points we'll be reviewing today, leadership tenants, leadership actions. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, I have the uh, taking the lead column in strategies and tactics for some years. And so today's session is based on research that I've done, as well as interviews with these very respected leaders um, in strategies and tactics. And, and these are people who are respected, not just because they're great PR practitioners or managers, but because they're such great and effective leaders. So we'll be sharing some of their, some of your knowledge with them today. And I think every bit of research and every interview I've done with these leaders, I think the most important leadership tenet is this notion of earning your people's trust, really standing by them. I mean, you wouldn't follow someone you don't trust, I wouldn't think. And don't assume that that trust exists just because of your title or if your name is on their paycheck or where you are on the org chart. Those of you old enough to remember that great commercial, it may have been for Lehman Brothers or one of the non-existent financial houses, but it was the great actor John Houseman, you may remember, and he talks about trust and he said, you have to earn it. And uh, it's true for all of us as well. Don't assume they trust you. They have to feel that you've earned their trust. They have to feel that you would stand by them and that you have their back. How do you get there? Well, you just act in a trustworthy manner, no matter the consequences. That's a quote from my dear friend, Patrice Tanaka. Act in a trustworthy manner, no matter the consequences. And you must do so consistently. Consistency is so vital and important in the area of trust and in the area of leadership in general. Um, consistency is everything. So if any of you have ever been in a workshop that I've led or some of my writing, you know I'm very honest about when I was in the agency business. I, I was in it 25 years before I became a trainer, consultant, and coach and um, got into management early and got into leadership early. And that was good in some ways and not so good in other ways. But I did have someone on my team who was very honest about giving me leadership performance feedback, something we'll talk about you know, within the hour. And I was blessed to have her. Now, 
in those, and what I learned from all this, that I wasn't a consistent leader. The, my nickname from my team was Uncle Ken. And that was lovely, and I prided myself on that. But I had another nickname, which was Evil Ben. And he showed up sometimes. And so I would occasionally get an email from said team member saying, uh, I hear Evil Ben's in the office. How is that helping us? Or, or what do you want to do about that? You know, that was wonderful, kind, direct, and diplomatic, and compassionate feedback from her, because it wasn't good when Evil Ben was in the house. So basically, you know, I learned that three days a week, maybe I was Uncle Ken, one day a week for sure I was Evil Ben, and one day a week they didn't know what they were going to get, which meant that they had trepidation coming into my office, speaking their truth, seeking my counsel and guidance, or sharing bad news, you know, about a client or about an outcome. And we can't have people afraid to come into our office if we're leading them, quite the opposite. So looking back, I, I wish I had been consistently good rather than great three days a week, evil Ben one day, and you know, who knows what. So consistency, consistency, consistency. Let me introduce uh, Richard Jones. He's had a variety of stellar positions, stellar leader across agency and corporate. And sometimes he's led huge teams, actually huge teams right now. He leads through influence the way their structure is at Guardian Life. And, um, you know, I think he agrees with me about the importance of trust and what, and I'm not going to read you people's quotes today because you can read it before. So, you know, but, but I will observe, I think he agrees with me and I hope you do that leadership is a two-part choice, two-part choice. Your conscious decision to lead, to lead people, to not just be a talented PR practitioner or even a manager, but to make that decision, I will lead with, with all that contains and all the pressure and all the responsibility. And your team members' decision to follow you or not, do not assume because of your title again or your place on the org chart that they automatically follow you. They have a choice. Now, they may come into the office, which nowadays is, you know, a Zoom meeting, and they may tick off the boxes and do the checklist, but they're not really following you necessarily unless they choose to. They're not in that boat. They're not rowing towards that vision, but they have the choice to do so at the top of the list is trust. They've got to feel they can trust you and you have their backs for them to choose to follow you. Here's Michelle Egan. Some of you recognize her as our PRSA national treasurer. Talk about a job, like a thankless job. Thank God she does it for us though. Uh, and she's also the chief communications officer of a pipeline company up in Anchorage. And she talks a lot about standing by her people, about asking them to take on challenges. And she knows they're going to make mistakes. She stands by those mistakes and, and they're her mistakes too. So do you tr truly own your followers' mistakes? That might be something to think about as you develop your list of actions today. Well, as a leadership coach, I know about energy and how it mirrors, how it's reciprocal, how it's contagious. I probably shouldn't use this word these days, but how it's viral energy is. So, you know, you get what you give. So give what you want. So if you want them to trust you, trust them back. And this has a very, very big impact in the employee marketplace among your followers. This is from a Harvard Business Review study, 2017, but I'm going to guess it hasn't changed much over these years. Uh, in a nutshell, when your team members feel less trusted, they exert less effort, they're less productive, they are more likely to leave. Now, I know with what's going on in the economy and in business, we may not be thinking much about retention and if will people leave. In fact, some of us 
have had to make the hard decision to let people go. But look, we know we're going to get through this all. We don't know what it's going to look like, but it will come back. Economy and business will come back. If you've been an evolved, trusting, trusted leader, that's going to hold you in good stead. Because when the business comes back, uh, the calls from recruiters will come back. And if you've been, as I said, an evolved leader, they're more likely to stay with you. But if you haven't been, they are more likely to lead. So you've got to think about how your leadership actions today during these uncertain times affect what will be in the future. At any rate, let, let's go more positive. I'm a more of an optimistic person. When employees and team members feel trusted, they are higher performers, there's extra effort, they go above and beyond expectation, they have greater confidence in the workplace, and obviously they're more likely to stay. So your trusting them has all kinds of ramifications. Point three, the queen of soul, Aretha was right, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, it is a critical part of leadership effectiveness. So taking this slide, won't read it to you, this is from a 2018 Georgetown University survey, 20,000 employees worldwide. And I think you see a big disconnect there. What might account for it? Well, people who don't get something are acutely aware of its absence. So employees who aren't shown respect are acutely aware of its absence. Now, people like you, like us, who hopefully get lots of respect on a regular basis, you know, we may not think about it very much. We don't always think about the things we get in abundance. So, you know, you just may be unaware of your employees take in this regard. The uh, studies uh, writers found a possibly bigger issue. Leaders like you may have an incomplete understanding of what constitutes workplace respect. They may not get what our employees view, we may not get what our employees view as workplace respect or respectful workplace environment. So your well-meaning efforts to provide a respectful workplace may fall short. So think about, are you really aware of what your team members feel is a respectful workplace? That might be an action to take. And can you confirm if you provide it? That might be another action to consider for your list. Uh, up until two weeks ago, there were only four global PR communications firms in the world that had women CEOs. And Barry Rafferty of Ketchum, who most of us associate with Ketchum, was one of them. And then two weeks ago, uh, she got an offer and took a job with Wells Fargo. Big, big challenging job. Uh, so now we only have three. But um, that doesn't affect her wisdom for us. And if, as you take in her slide and her knowledge, think about this, especially when you've got to give what some people call constructive critique. I call it constructive feedback. And, you know, if you're a leader, you, you're going to have these discussions frequently about job performance or work output or behavior. But, but I don't believe in calling it constructive critique because I find for most of us, we go too quickly to the critique, to changing the behavior, to improving the work product, to changing, we, we go right into critique. So let's call it constructive feedback. Why? Because it's feedback that allows us to construct, that allows us to build. So, we're not just thinking about the error made or the work product that needs to be improved or the performance that needs to be improved. We're thinking about constructing, building trust, which builds our relationship with the team member. And when you build that, they perceive, wow, they think I can do better. They think I have the chops to do better. They're helping me do better. They know my performance can improve. That's a rich gift to give any of your followers, and it will open them to further constructive feedback from you, which is exactly what we want. So they don't dread those conversations. They're open to it. 
but you've got to be conscious of it. You've got to be mindful. You've got to see it as an opportunity to build trust, build the relationship, and think about how you will consistently communicate respect during those sessions. And as Barry says, I feel like if I give it to others in a nice way, I'm going to get it back. It's that reciprocity in energy and in all things. Here's, we're going to go to a deep section now, four of our eight. The notion of asking the right questions and really, really listening. So Harold Burson, the iconic PR leader we lost, I think, in 2019, had a great quote, two eyes, two ears, one mouth. So we should listen and see twice as much as we speak. That's when the learning really starts. And I think he was so right. Now, I was born in the Bronx. For those of you who don't know New York geography, it's that uh, borough on the mainland in New York City. But I grew up in Yonkers, as we pronounced it, which is the city just north of the Bronx. And all our parents were from the Bronx. So um, as someone who uh, was born in the Bronx and grew up in Yonkers, let me give you a piece of advice based on my extensive scholarly research. If you want to be a more effective leader, shut up and listen. Shut up and listen. Think about your ratio. I think if we're honest, our speaking, listening ratio tends to be 60-40 or worse, 70-30 many of the leaders I've come across. So you want to flip those numbers. I believe, you know, speak 60, listen 40, or uh, sorry, listen 60, speak 40, or better yet, listen 70, speak 30. It really will work. It's about changing our ratios. Why is this so important? Well, let me give you three points. This is from Fairy Godboss. It is a website as ostensibly about uh, to and from female women leaders. The knowledge on there is for everyone, and it's really powerful. So anyway, according to Fairy Godboss, asking these asking questions, effective questions, the right questions, gives you three powerful advantages as a leader. I can't imagine there's anyone on this call who doesn't want these three things. So let me, let me share some thinking about this. You know, astute leaders know there's more to giving up the floor than to dominate it, than by dominating it. And I think if we're honest about our leadership styles, many of us dominate the floor too much. Not effective leadership. Remember, the purpose of communications is not to message, it's to engage. And you can only engage if you're listening effectively and you've got the proper listening speaking ratio. So let me give you a couple of mantras that may help you in this. Seek to understand more than to be understood. Seek to hear more than to be heard. I think that can help you in any kind of dialogue, but especially when you have dialogue that might need to be challenging or difficult an honest conversation, uh, you know, conflict resolution, seek to understand more than to be understood, seek to hear more than to be heard. That will change the entire dynamic. You know, another one that I use, I had to switch, you know, as an agency person, I was more of a consultant. And when I switched into leadership coaching, I created a new mantra, which is don't talk, listen. Don't talk, listen. Anyway, let's move on. Here's a good friend, Lynn Kenny. Big title, VP, Area Head, Corporate Communications, North America, RB. Many of you know it as Reckitt Ben Kieser. They make Woolite and other great products. And uh, we featured her in taking the lead in print. And we now have videos on our website, jacobscom.com, also called Taking the Lead. And I want to encourage you to visit uh, the website, not because just because I want you to visit the website, of course I do, and to watch the videos, of course I do. But uh, we interviewed Lynn um, two months ago about leading through uncertain times. 
And I really encourage you to, to watch that video. Her insights are, I think, brilliant and practical and inspiring and helping. And her energy will just leaps across the computer. She has a delicious energy. And, you know, if you're having a bad day, a slow day or whatever, watch Lynn's segment. The energy will just uplift you. Um, but anyway, let's get to her point, which is she talks about, you know, silently guiding opinions from the mouths of the teams. And you can't do that if you're talking. You can only get silently guide those opinions by, you know, asking good questions and listening. Let's, if I haven't convinced you yet, here are five more uh, advantages for effective listening for leaders. This is from the ATD, the Association for Talent Development. So all things HR, all things talent, all things retention. I would be shocked if any of you don't want most of these five things. So I think we, we're building a really good case for effective listening. Um, Here's a study from Zenger and Folkman. It is from 2017. It was of more than 50,000 executives. But in a nutshell, you know, if you want your teams to perceive you as an effective leader and in leadership, the perception of your team is everything. If you want to be perceived as a leader, shut up and listen. It really works. And, you know, it's not just something to force yourself to do. If you are trying to create change, a change in your leadership style, a change in your organization, more business, better relationships with clients, whatever it may be, make it something you want to do, not something you have to do. And this applies even to things we want in life. Um, getting to a healthy weight, smoking cessation, don't make it a burden. Don't make it something you have to do. Make it something you want to do. Think back to college. If you had, you know, one class you really didn't enjoy, but maybe you did your homework, you did your, you know, assignment, your term paper, because you had to do it because you didn't want an F. Okay, that's one level of motivation. But think about the class that you enjoyed and you learned from. Hopefully it was a PR class, right? Um, you really wanted to learn it. It was something you wanted that's a whole higher level of motivation and inspiration. So before we go to the next slide, let me ask you, should you have a definitive leadership style, a definitive leadership communication style? So I'm imagining a lot of you raising your hand, saying yes, eh, wrong answer, but it is a bit of a trick question. You want to customize, you want to create a bespoke, leadership style, like this beautiful suit from Hong Kong or Savile Row, the more you're willing to create a bespoke leadership style, the more effective you will be as a leader. You want to understand of everyone you lead, their motivations, their passions, their worldview and their views and their dreams, their dreams for themselves and their careers and their dreams for, the, for your organization, which they have but you only get that if you customize your leadership style based on all of that. It's even more important if you're leading leaders, as many of you now are, or leading what I call next gen or leaders in training, put the time in to understand which, now you're gonna start with your core leadership style, of course, and your core leadership communication style, yes, but then customize, customize, customize. Let me give you an example. Many of you have taken Myers-Briggs, MBLT, and if you have, you know you get those four letters that sort of describe what you are and describe you know, what your team is, if you all take it, and you should. So going back to mine, you know, I'm an extrovert, not an introvert. I think you know that. I'm a feeler, not a thinker. You may know that. If you don't know it already, you're probably getting that vibe. Uh, and I never remember the other two. I should look them up. But at any rate, the person who did this assessment pointed out to me that, you know, I'm a strong E, I'm a strong F, but I have someone on my team who was a strong I, introvert, and a thinker, a T. And that 
my feely sort of communications was probably not working for her, was probably not connecting us. So she said, you know, when you meet, don't start with the social, don't start with how was your weekend, don't start with how is your kid's soccer game. I mean, do that for the feelers on your team, but get right to business and be mindful of thinking versus feeling language. So I had to minimize things like heart and imagine and, and I feel what we should do with, I know what we should do, here's what I see. I think the answer is clear. Do you, you sense the difference? I was using thinking language and uh, that really worked at, at connecting us better. So determine what each of your followers needs to maximize a bespoke communication style. Yes, this will take some time. And a lot of what we're gonna talk, we've talked about and we'll continue talking about today will take time, but it's not an expense. It's an investment. It's one that you should absolutely believe will give you ROI. Because if you've customized your leadership style to everyone who follows you, who reports to you, it's much more efficient. It's much more effective. There's less re-explaining or over-explaining or the work doesn't come out right because they really haven't understood you. So it absolutely will give you ROI. I'm convinced of that. Um, here's Jennifer Thompson, also from Alaska. Uh, she was our conference chair, Counselors Academy. The last spring conference we had in person in 2019 in St. Pete. And um, I, I don't usually have much to add when Jen speaks. She's a great communicator, but I think she's very right about, you know, these individual motivators because different things motivate different team members. Here's another great leader I admire. It's Brett Werner. He's been a very effective leader at three different firms. Um, he's now with MWWPR in New York and New Jersey. And uh, he's one of the two leaders I'll share with you who came through the ranks early. And as in my situation, that has some advantages and disadvantages, but Brett acknowledges he didn't always fully understand that it takes people of different personalities and perspectives to build a world-class agency. And I think that's true to build a world-class organization, group, or department. So it's a skill he learned. It came with age. But you can start to learn that now, if you haven't yet, and you can take action on it as well. It's a really critical lesson, I believe. Six out of eight, know thyself. Let's think about this. Your communication and behaviors are under greater scrutiny. Your words have a lot of weight and they can affect your followers' choices and behaviors and performance. Why? It's all due to your position and your visibility. So the chance of being misinterpreted is pretty great. So you got to get it right because of the impact. Unaware leaders who are unaware of their leadership approach, their leadership style, risk losing credibility and their ability to influence their team. So who's the best judge of your leadership effectiveness? Guess what? It's not you. It's those you lead. And that can include, again, your team, your peers, your boss, other stakeholders in your organization, other people, if you're, if you're in leadership with a PRSA chapter. The aforementioned study found that leaders who ask for feedback are rated substantially higher in leadership effectiveness. Just by asking for feedback, isn't that powerful? And that's feedback about their leadership performance. It can be difficult, but it is so worthwhile. And that's, this is just one example. So, so there we go. So you really wanna seek out that feedback and know that you can't get it seated across the table from the person you're leading. I mean, you're not going to get objective, honest, compassionate, direct, but specific feedback about your leadership in a one-on-one -on -one with someone because if, if you are responsible for their 
career path, their promotions, their reviews and evaluations, their salary and their bonuses, for the most part, they're going to tell you what you want to hear, despite the example I gave you earlier about this one person who gave me that feedback. It can be tough to read or to hear, but it is one of the most important things you can do to become a more effective leader. It's one of the most important actions you can take. Um, as a coach, and, and many of you may know this, our perceptions absolutely determine our realities. So how do you want to think about all this? Uh, Margie Fox was a very creative leader at the now defunct Maloney and Fox, but boy, she's something. She was going to give me some feedback that had come through the team. And she saw me tighten up and get tense and not want to hear it. She said, look, Ken, you can look at this any way you want. If you look at it as a present, as a gift that you can unwrap and take in and become a more effective leader, because that's what they want from you, um, it will be that gift. So great lesson about perception. So if you view all this as wisdom, that will allow you to become a more effective, motivating and inspiring leader, the kind of leader your team really wants you to be. If you view it that way, that's how you'll take it in and that's how you will become that more effective leader. Now, been coaching agency and corporate leaders a long time, 12 years, I think, and I've been conducting 360 feedback for those 12 years, I've observed a real gap. There is a gap between how leaders think their teams perceive them and their leadership and how those teams perceive those leaders and that leadership. It's a big gap. And if you don't yet follow, know of or follow the Planck Center on Leadership, you really should. It's named after Betsy Planck, who is just this remarkable Chicago PR area leader. And the uh, center named after her is not about PR. It's all about leadership, which I think is great. Um, but they have found, if you've seen these studies, such a big gap where leaders overall give themselves for their leadership performance or, or how they think their teams would rank them as leaders. Lots of A's, lots of A minuses, maybe some B plus. But guess what? All the followers are ranking B minus, C plus, C and lower. It's a big gap. It can make or break you. So I strongly recommend you take some action to fill that gap. Let me introduce you to Valerie Simon. We all cheer about Valerie because she's the PR person who became the chief marketing officer. Yay, PR people becoming CMOs. And, um, you know, she talks about this self-awareness, she talks about this reflection, and she talks about the feedback she gets from her team. And I believe Valerie's team members aren't afraid to criticize or challenge or give this feedback because she has sought it out. And I think she's made them feel trusted and respected. So now you're seeing how of these eight parts really are interlaced and interwoven. And if we start to work on some of them, we really can become, well, I'd love for you to work on all of them, but we, we can become more effective leaders. Okay, point seven and eight, and then we'll take questions. Del we're about 10 minutes and We're good then, we are perfect, thank you. Letting go and empowering, it's such an important thing to do, and so many of us resist it. Why do we resist it? Because we focus on what we might be giving away. If we're giving away the lowest 10 or 15% of our jobs, you know, we're giving away stuff we're good at, we enjoy, comes naturally, maybe we've done for a while. So of course we resist give, why would we give away something that feels so good? Well, so instead, focus on what you'll gain if you delegate and empower. Focus on what you will get, and you're gonna get a lot. You're gonna get the opportunity to grow your organization or division or agency or nonprofit. I hope I haven't missed anyone. You have a chance to grow your leadership bench, your leaders in training. And isn't that a responsibility, you know, part of our leadership legacy? You get a chance to grow yourself. 
to do that leadership development or professional development you know you want to do. And you get to do the things that probably only you can do. So if you think about, you know, and I know, you know, leaders should be willing to jump in and roll up our sleeves when necessary. And more of us are doing it now because some teams have shrunk. But you want to be mindful. Am I doing the job two levels below my job on a regular basis. If you are, that tells us something. That may tell us that the job that only you can do isn't being done. Things like I just mentioned, and, and these other things that are probably in your job description, vision, strategy, long-term planning, culture, talent retention and talent engagement. And if you're on the agency side, business development. If you're doing those other things, who's doing these things? So you're not doing your job. You just, yeah, you have to delegate and empower. But again, I believe if you focus on the things you'll get, you'll really want to delegate and empower. So something to think about. We'll go back to our friend, Michelle, and she's right when you find the balance she talks about here. It's exciting and I'd add fulfilling. Joel Curran, he uh, was a corporate guy, agency guy. He is now the Associate Chancellor of Public Affairs at UNC Chapel Hill, put it very succinctly. Create the objective, share the strategy, and get the hell out of the way. Gosh, you'd think he's from Yonkers or the Bronx, the way he speaks. So, you know, virtual show of hands. How many of you need to get the hell out of the way? Well, create the objectives, share the strategies, and then get the hell out of the way. I'm guessing it's most of you. Here's a, a younger leader, or she was younger when she met, it's Rebecca Mosley, at a Counselors Academy Spring Conference, which I've mentioned four or five years ago, she was my little buddy. She was the newbie, and I was her big buddy. I don't know if that's the exact titles we use, but um, so, so I was the big buddy, and two years later, she was conference chair talk about a remarkable leader. And she talks about how scary it is to allow things to really empower, to allow decision-making to take place without her involvement and allowing her team members to stumble and recover without her stepping in. It's gonna to be tough, but it's so worth it because as she says, it allows them to learn from their own experiences. And I think that is part of our leadership obligation our leadership legacy to prepare the next generation. Just as I hope someone in your career prepared you to be a better leader. We'll go back to Barry very quickly. She talks about creating this vision and then letting others paint it, create it. So a good question to ask yourself, are you having your team conform to your way of doing things or are you really giving them the freedom to bring their own approach and style to deliver on your vision. In other words, you tell them the what and they figure out the how. That's very empowering. Here's our last point before we go to questions. And it's so much fun to present it because it's about appreciating your team's value and recognizing their gifts and saying thank you, what a joy. Um, so let's ban Employee Appreciation Day. We've got to appreciate them every day of the year, every day, every interaction. Why? Recognized employees are more engaged, more motivated, more loyal, and they're going to hang around longer, even and especially as this business comes out. Appreciative leaders are appreciated. They're followed. I, I hope all of you want to be that kind of leader. So I mentioned one leader, Brett Werner, who came to leadership early. Here is Kim White. We knew early on seeing her as a, as a clearly having leadership potential, leader in training, future leader, back when I was at Ogilvy Adams and Reinhardt decades ago. But she came to it earlier uh, than many. One day the announcement went up and people to whom she reported to, some of them now reported to her, People to whom uh, that uh, were her peers now reported to her, and people who were her direct reports now reported through someone else. So big organizational structural change. Uh, and one lesson she learned 
as an, as an earlier young leader is uh, it's something none of us ever outgrows. And she needed to share that gratitude with people who had been around for a while and how powerful that was. So I want you to know that if you learn to say thank you the right way, and we'll get that in our next slide, there is no end to how often you say, can say thank you. There is no end to the impact it has on them, to the effect it has on them, to their loyalty to you, their loyalty to the organization, and their desire to do even better. So it is so, so worth it, I think, to say thank you the right way. Oh, went ahead, sorry. Um, to say thank you the right way. Here's, here's how you say thank you the right way. Be specific. Don't just say, thanks for your hard work, thanks for your effort. That's something you could have told me two months ago. That's something you could have be telling anyone on the team. Be specific. So let's say, do we still, I don't know if we still have media conferences, press conferences. Let's just assume we do. So don't just say thanks for your hard work and effort around that press conference. Say thank you for being so strategic in your pursuit of the most influential media. I noticed that we had a 10% increase in attendance by the media most important to our clients. They appreciate it, and so do I. So very, very specific, right? And then in an age of emails and texts, write it. Get some good quality stock, either personal or from your organization. Good, thick, heavy stock, good envelope. Imagine that tactile experience when they get it from you in the mail, because you can't put it on their desks, I'm imagining these days, and they open it and they feel it, and they see your words in the best possible pen and ink you can, and they see your specific thanks. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience. And as the great poet Maya Angelou is alleged to have said, you know, they may not remember your words, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that is so true. So thank them the right way, be more specific, do it in writing, do it more often. I think I might've said that twice, but maybe that's for a reason. But don't fret about your words. They'll never forget how you made them feel. So these are eight leadership actions, but wait, there are 11. That doesn't make sense. I'll explain that in a moment. I just wanna end with this notion of, it starts with you, your ROI on your time today isn't about my contents, but about your actions. So I hope you've created that list that we've talked about. And that leads me into five offers I'm gonna to make to you today. I make it to everyone who participates in one of our sessions. One, send me your action list if you want. I'll be your accountability buddy. We can have a complimentary session in 30 days. We'll celebrate what you were able to implement and we will uh, work with you if there are any roadblocks or hurdles to your achieving those actions, we'll help you through that. Two, if you're struggling through these uncertain times, as many are, we can do a session, a complimentary session to come up with strategies to help you lead yourself and others more effectively in these times. Third, if you just want to be a better leader, if you feel you're strong in some ways, but you could, you know, you're doing fine through COVID-19, but you think you could be a more effective leader, let's have a complimentary session to discuss that, to help you, to empower you, I should say. It's my pleasure to do so. And uh, four, there are going to be five. Four is, um, if you want these slides as a PDF, email me, ken at jacobscom.com. I'm happy to send you the PDF. I probably should have mentioned that up front so you didn't have to take notes furiously, but you'll have all these. And we have, as you can see on your slide, we've done a leadership ebook, complimentary on the website if you wanna download it. So I may have gone over, I'm sorry. And Stephanie, please let me know if you've got questions in the queue. Yeah, I have a question here. Um, how can older leaders better meet the needs of and attract and retain highly sought after millennial employees? 
Excellent question. And now you've got to do millennials and start to learn about Gen Z, right? Because they're, they're entering the workplace. You know, I think it's two or three things. One is study up. You know, I, I, I'm a big fan of millennials, Gen X, uh, Gen, wait, Gen Y, sorry. Gen X is there, then millennials, Gen Y. I'm a big fan. Uh, what's the word they say about them that they're, I always blank on this word, begins with an E. Well, whatever it is, I don't think they're that. They think they have the world coming to them. I'm just having a senior, I'm having a baby boomer moment forgetting that word. Entitled, entitled. Thank you. I don't think they're entitled. I think they're wonderful and they can bring so much to your organization. But as PR people, just as you wouldn't create a PR plan without studying the different demographics you want to engage with and maybe share ideas with and sell to, you've got to study up on this generation. And there's so much out there. If you email me, I have something from years ago about managing and leading this generation, but it's still true. Even though you know the older millennials are like 38 and 40. They're well within management and leadership. But if you study and understand the different cultural and technological differences that make them what they are, you will be better able to manage and lead them. The most important thing is respect, 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 respect. But if you respect them and you study up and you lead them uh, based on your knowledge of them, they will bring so much to you and so much to your organization. And again, they're leaders and managers now. Yeah, younger is a relative term, right? <laughs> I, I have another question for you. Right. Um, do, do we need to change our leadership style now that we are meeting with and leading our teams remotely instead of face-to-face? -face? Oh, great question. Well, it depends what your style is now, but I think it's certainly worth considering. I think leading people and having them feel that connectivity via Zoom, uh, you know, I mean, so, you know, I've always felt in-person best, then, then phone, email is not a great way to connect. I, I, we could do a whole session on why email is not a great way to lead people. So I think a few things, you Zoom more and more. I think many organizations are doing the team meetings, the happy hours, the talk about how are we all getting through this? How are we, you know, how are we doing? But I think what's really important for you as a leader, even if many on your team seem okay with work from home or okay with back to work on a limited basis, don't assume. If you have a, a team of 12 and it seems like everybody's fine, I bet one or two aren't so fine. So that one-on-one -on -one reach out, how are you doing? How can I support you? How are you doing trying to get your work done with an adorable three-year-old at home? You know, your, your coworker, as we call them. You know, how is it going? How can we, what can we do differently for you? Engage more and more in that kind of dialogue because if there is someone working from home and not doing well and needs your help, or if there's someone who's being encouraged to go back to the office and they're not ready, they're just anxious and they're not focusing on the work. They're not focusing on, you know, output and performance. So step in as a, step in as a human leader, as a leader of emotional beings and inquire, ask questions, listen, and, and be there for them. And that question, how can I support you in this is very powerful. That's great. Uh, does anybody else have any questions uh, before we wrap up? Go ahead and put it in the chat right now. And Ken, I, I know I wrote some good notes down and, and it was very informative, so. Great. Yeah. There's another, I, I, I think we have one other, do we have another question or just a comment? I think, I think, I think we might be good on our questions. Okay. You know what? Hold on. I missed a couple. They went into the chat instead of um, the question and answer section. So I, I don't know why we separate chat and Q&A. I don't I either. Yeah, well, I, I want to chat about my question. I don't, you know, so. Yes. So um, here we go. Would you good. recommend getting constructive feedback from your team members in group setting instead of one-on-one -on -one to ensure everyone feels safe in expressing their thoughts? Um, not really, because then we're, we're, they're sharing what they're sharing based on what the other person said, and should I be more honest or less, and 
Do I kiss butt a little bit? I think something objective, either hire a third party, you know, there are surveys out there, or survey monkey, do something, you want that honest in your face feedback. And, and just as I don't think you'll get it one on one, I don't think you'll get because if I'm in a session and, and I have an issue with my leader, and two of the people and, and maybe they, you know, I, I shouldn't have assumed that maybe they're not kissing butt, maybe they really like the leadership style and they're happy with it and they communicate that, am I gonna go on a limb and say, I need something different from you, boss? I don't think so. So I think you need something objective, either hire someone, survey monkey, maybe there are other tools out there so you can get that feedback and you wanna be able to line it up. You know, you wanna be able to see what are the trends in my leadership? I mean, that's why doing 360s and having someone analyze them and write a report is so effective. I mean, what we do is when, when we do them, we look at what are the big trends? What are, where is the leader leading really well? Because sometimes, you know, I talked about leaders not being aware. There may be things you're doing as a leader that's really effective and keep doing it. It's great. It's powerful. You didn't realize how inspiring and motivating it was. But, um, but we want to see the trends. What are the biggest things I need to work on as a leader? And so there are tools that I think, you know, even in SurveyMonkey, I think you would be able to create something that would allow you easily to go in and say, okay, there's my five big things, or there are even the three big things I'm gonna work on. 